Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And I'm talking about methane um, that has basically been released from methane hydrates on the seafloor and has made it past the sulfur um, zone, which would um, which which would um, where the methane would undergo anaerobic oxidation and um, be not enter the water column. But some of the methane that enters the water will enter the water column, and it forms these these bubbles will start rising up, and basically there is now dissolution. The bubbles can dissolve into the water, and there's also aerobic uh, decomposition of the methane. So. For example, 50% of the methane in the bubble at the seafloor, for it to reach the atmosphere, um, you need at least 14 millimeter diameter bubbles at 50 meters, or 20 millimeter diameter bubbles at 100 meters to get up to the surface, or even larger bubbles at greater water depths. So this is, uh, you know, the study of this is still in its infancy. I'm not sure why. I mean, this is very critical to how much methane gets into the atmosphere. Um, so, and then once it's dissolved in the ocean water, it can be exchanged with the gas, especially if there's rough water. Um, high winds and storms can re re release more methane, um, but in deeper waters, the methane can remain in the ocean for centuries and, and be cycled through um, the uh, ocean, you know, with long lag times. So this is showing the depth at which the bubble is released and the percentage of the initial methane that reaches the sea surface, so, um, and the initial bubble diameter in millimeters. Um, so if you have, um, not sure why this, this should be 18 here, got cut off, 18 millimeters, this last entry. So as the bubble diameter is increasing, then more of the methane um, will reach the surface from greater depth. So, um, so if we follow, you know, we take a bubble diameter here, you know, if it's released at 220 meters, you know, nothing gets to the surface, 120 meters, nothing. Some of it will start getting to the surface now. Um, so the closer it's released to the surface, the larger the fraction that will, will get to the surface. Um, this is an example of the, this is a sonar image showing, you know, when there's bubbles, you get a large return signal. So we've got the seafloor here and we've got methane being released in bubbles. And these bubbles, you know, most of them aren't getting up to the surface. And this was on, um, this was, where was this? Uh, hydroacoustic image off the Baltimore Canyon, the U.S. Atlantic margin um, in 2015. Okay, so once it's dissolved in seawater, then there's aerobic microbial oxidation, um, which is a strong sink, which um, re it re so the methane is, is uh, broken down by microbes in the water column. Um, and the rates of this, you know, depend on a lot of different factors, um, but, um, there's time constants in these processes. This is day, uh, day inverse days. Um, and um, so there's estimates that basically there's the oxidation in marine sediments was 80 to 90% of the 400 teragrams released. Um, and then the oceanic sinks are, um, basically considered to be equal to or potentially greater than all the atmospheric sinks of methane. And the sinks in, of methane in the atmosphere are the OH minus, uh, mostly the hydroxide. Um, but, you know, how the, this reaction changes with water temperature, how it changes with the, um, with, you know, with the other conditions like salinity of the water column, amount of oxygen, that's in the water column at various depths, um, trace metals, nutrients, all of these different factors um, can affect this reaction. 
Okay, um, so bubble stripping, which is the shrinking of bubbles as they're rising up due to dissolution or dissolving of the, of the gas into the water column and then the water column oxidation may prevent much of the CO2 emitted at the seafloor from ever reaching the sea air interface. Um, but then, th but this does have a big impact on ocean chemistry and so on. Um, okay, so there's this factor going on as well. Um, there's also uh, terrestrial sinks that are occurring for the methane hydrates that are underneath the, um, the ground. And, you know, we've talked about the, um, you know, in the past, we've seen these blowholes in Siberia, you know, which are, you know, some, some people are, are attributing those to methane hydrates underneath, because if you get the thawing and the 180 times expansion of volume, the pressure can build up and it can blow material out and form these craters. Um, but there's yet the other view is that they're just slumps of unfrozen ground um, that are just collapsing. Um, so talic collapsing and then the methane in the atmosphere of course is reacted and broken down by uh, mostly by hydroxide which is formed from the breakdown of water vapor um, so that oxidation uh, reduces the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere but then you know if you're producing CO2 from that breakdown then you need to consider that so the lifetime of atmospheric methane is, you know, in the range of 8.9 plus or minus 0.6 years in this paper to, you know, the IPCC more recent number, you know, about 12 years or so. Um, okay, so, so basically in order to try to assess the risks of, you know, f figure out how much methane can come up um, in these pulses or in short periods of time, we can look at past really warm periods like the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, hypo, hyperthermals are called, and also look at, you know, I look at how much maybe methane was released based on the methane captured in, in ice core data. So, so <coughs> there's certain periods of Earth's history where the temp where, where the planet has undergone, you know, very, very rapid, abrupt changes and you know can these be attributed to methane so what about this uh, methane clathrate gun you know um you know can large releases of methane did they occur and were they responsible for causing uh you know very rapid changes in temperature in the past and are we going to get something happening again so this paper you know looks at various periods you know in the deep past and in the more recent past um and you know, the jury is still out because the, even this event, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, um, it's estimated the, um, in order to try to figure out the carbon emitted that caused this excursion, um, then, you know, there, there's uh, basically, uh, there was a recent study looked at the release rate of carbon during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, so 55.5 million years ago, and it was only 1.1, or less than 1.1 petagrams per year. Now the current rate of methane release from the seafloor ranges from 0.016 to 3.2 petagrams per year. So, you know, bracketing this number. Um, so, it's the modern seafloor methane emission is potentially comparable to that during the paleo eocene paleocene eocene thermal maximum already um so the idea of the methane gun the clathrate gun um so there's um so kennett you know there's actually a book with this name basically the clathrate gun you know looking at this particular hypothesis, you know, did it happen? You know, how quickly did things change? And, you know, one of the things that happened was that the, uh, you know, sea levels have a very big impact on the amount of methane released. Um, and, you know, as you get warming and sea level rises, that would be expected to reduce the 
uh, probability of large methane emissions from the seafloor because the pressure has increased. But, you know, if there's lots of pressure on the earth and lots of isostatic rebound and things are moving and shifting and there's more earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff, then there can be large underwater landslides, which could then potentially release large amounts of methane, so large scale submarine slope failures, um, erosional episodes, for example. So you could have large amounts of gas um, that was released and went up into the atmosphere and stuff. But it's very, it's very difficult to uh, calculate sort of probabilities of these things happening. Um, you know, in this paper, there were papers that showed that these slope failures um, most often happen during the Heinrich event, not the Dansgaard Osher event. So Heinrich events, when there were mass armadas of, of icebergs breaking off um, from the Laurentian ice sea, sheet, etc., and crossing the Atlantic and cooling. Um, so that would, uh, you know, that, so, uh, so, you know, we could look at the ice core records on Greenland and Antarctica and try to uh, wiggle match them and try to figure out, you know, how the methane varied and, you know, but even, you know, we don't see that much variation recorded between the methane, you know, going back, you know, a million years. It's varied between about 350, 400 and 700 parts, parts, per, bil um, parts per billion. So, um, so basically, so, so there's lots of different, um, you know, so th this is an interesting map, um, which I showed at the very beginning, showing the different methane, you know, we have the sources and we have different sinks in the seafloor and in the water column and in the atmosphere. So the picture is very, you know, is very complicated. In other words, there's lots of questions. Um, there's lots of, you know, so here, here's some example of where some of the hydrates are coming up from. So onshore permafrost hydrates, estimated methane in place, um, the type of methane. So this is thermogenic from the earth as opposed to biogenic. Um, the, nominal, the shallowest depths and the susceptibility to climate change. So there's a whole analysis here. Um, okay, the subsea permafrost, subglacial, um, upper continental slopes, deep marine, and so on. Um, so all of those things can be looked at. Then there's the gas hydrates on land the terrest you know the terrestrial permafrost stuff and uh, okay so there's lots of different um, things this is just showing uh, you know some of the different regions so methane from wetlands thermal karst, karst lakes there's coal bed methane methane in the permafrost methane in gaseous form the conventional methane gas which is obtained from fracking etc so there's thermogenic conventional gas here, the gas hydrate dissociation, coal bed methane, microbial effects, modern and previously frozen carbon. So there's all of these different processes that are going on that we can look at. So we can try to assess, you know, each one of these and see how much we think uh, is coming up. And um, so, you know, I'll just kind of scroll down here um, you know, this is very accessible. This is interesting because it's showing that, you know, you don't need that much ice and then you can have methane existing, you know, in the sediments under the ice um, as gaseous form if the bottom of the ice is warmer and if it's colder and, and there's uh, permafrost underneath the ice, you can have, uh, you know, lots of methane in the sediments and so on under the ice sheets. So if these sheets rapidly um, leave the surface and this methane underneath here can be released and this would have been a big factor with the melting of the Laurentian ice sheet covering North America but is less of an we haven't seen this we haven't realized this yet because we still have ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica but as those sheets rapidly go we can have lots of methane coming up from there so um, I'll have one more video I think to finish up